Welcome to the Da Vinci Hour, a podcast series that interviews individuals across the field of medicine to help provide an inside look into their experiences and provide insight on how to navigate the journey of becoming a physician. My name is Dr. Maxwell Cooper, and I will be your host. This podcast is brought to you by Da Vinci Academy, a medical education company that provides online video courses, outline format books, and clinical case videos for students studying the medical basic sciences. You can check out all that Da Vinci Academy has to offer at www.dviacademy.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Da Vinci Hour podcast. I'm joined this week by Dr. Lars Svensson, one of my earliest mentors in medicine. Uh, I was a research assistant for him during my pre-med days, and he is a cardiothoracic surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio, and the chairman of the Heart and Vascular Institute there. So, Dr. Svensson, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Sure, it's my pleasure. It's a delight and great to see how well you've done, Max, and uh, we go back a long way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so maybe give us a little bit of background on your your education, your training. Um, you know, it's quite, a, quite an interesting story. I, I remember you telling it to me back in the, our research days together. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, in high school, was very much interested in doing mechanical engineering, and then the first heart transplant was done in Cape Town and my father had me listen to the news. And I then started thinking more about medicine. And so uh, in college, I thought more along those lines, although in college, I never did biology, whether botany or zoology, and went straight into medical school when I was 17 years old. And um, in medical school, I had a interest in cardiology But um, my professor in cardiology uh, was a, or he is still famous, but he passed away, Um, John Barlow. So most people in cardiovascular medicine know about Barlow's valve. And so he was my mentor and I worked for him in my junior residency training program uh, under him. And uh, I asked him about when the first balloon angioplasty was done. So Grunzig did this in 1979 in a surgery laboratory. And he said, look, if you're interested in that, it's probably going to take 20 years to perfect. And he was off by three, maybe five years. Uh, And he said, uh, why don't you go into cardiac surgery? So I went along. Uh, thinking that that's what I'd do. I actually got a job with uh, Chris Barnard um, in Cape Town, and then he stopped operating. And so I uh, apologized to Prof Barlow and, uh, sorry, Prof Barnard, and said, you know, I'm going to pursue my further studies in cardiac surgery in the United States. And so that's how I ended up at the Cleveland Clinic first, and then with uh, Michael DeBakey and uh, Stanley Crawford in Houston. And I did my residency in cardiothoracic surgery there, worked in New England, and then came back to the Cleveland Clinic some 20 years ago. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, for giving us. And from what I understand, Dr. Barnard, he was the first, was it, I always get these mixed up. Was he the first to attempt a human heart transport or actually, or successfully perform one? He, he was the first to do a successful a heart transplant, and he developed about six new techniques, um, apart from operative procedures, also the piggyback heart, um, and he did a, a lot of research in that field of transplantation, but he originally got his interest from working with another well-known heart surgeon, Vincent Gott, uh, when they worked for a very famous surgeon, Dr. Lillehei, in Minnesota, and Vincent Gott went on to become chairman of cardiac surgery at John Hopkins, and there was also a link to Denton Cooley, um, and uh, that's how he got interested in that. And then later, there's always been some disagreement about who did the most research and who pioneered uh, heart transplantation in animals, and certainly a lot was done in uh, England, in fact. And then, uh, obviously, Dr. Shumway was the great American pioneer in heart transplant and followed shortly after by Dr. Uh, Cooley and Dr. DeBakey. Gotcha. So where has your area of cardiac thoracic surgery focus been over your career? 
When I first uh, was in Houston, was mainly uh, aortic surgery, so ascending aorta, aortic arch, and thoracoabdominal, and descending aortic surgery and prevention of complications was my interest both in my lab work um, and also from a clinical point of view. And um, then in Boston and uh, Cleveland Clinic, I started turning my uh, attention more to invasive valve procedures, and uh, I was very involved with the original research on um, minimal invasive uh, heart surgery, particularly what we call the J incision. Uh, that was something that I came up with after having watched Dr. Toby Cosgrove do paramedian or right thoracotomy incisions. And then um, after that, the growing field of transcatheter valves. And so I did some of the original animal work on uh, the transapical approach for putting in uh, valves and uh, later help with creating the uh, partner trial uh, infrastructure, working with the FDA on how that would look as far as a prospective randomized trial. And uh, I, for a number of years, ran the publications committee for the partner trial. And we produced well over 100 publications uh, on transcatheter aortic valves during that period. That's amazing. I, I remember when during my time with you, uh, you for, I think that those were kind of some of the earlier days or, you know, developing. I remember watching going in and watching some of those cases with you. And uh, I remember it was kind of still early in development, which was really exciting. It's just amazing to see how far that proceed those types of procedures have come in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. Yeah, it is amazing. You know, when we were doing the animal work, we were running about a 40% embolization rate. And uh, there were a number of reasons that, that we don't have time to go into those. But now it's extraordinary. We rarely have embolization with TAVOS, and we typically run a, a 0.5, so uh, 1 in 200 risk of death. And uh, the, the patients do amazingly well. And to see, for example, a patient who has had previous valve procedures go home the next day after percutaneous valve is quite extraordinary. Yeah, that's amazing. So now, you know, since since our time together uh, doing research, on top of the hundreds of surgeries you do a year, now you've added the uh, position of chairman of the Heart and Vascular Institute. So I'm wondering what maybe tell us a little bit about your your day to day responsibilities for that, and kind of your your long term kind of responsibilities as well for that position. Yeah, it's a matter of uh, uh, sort of cramming a lot of responsibilities into a day. So I typically start in ICU just after six o'clock in the morning. It's the only predictable part of my day. And so I round up my ICU patients and floor patients. And uh, then the meetings usually start after that. And uh, then I meet my patients in the operating room uh, at seven o'clock. Um, and I still operate every morning. Uh, usually I do two cases every day. My schedule's just changed recently because we're working a lot of number of enterprise-related issues. And then I do my two cases, uh, see some new patients, review potential patients who need surgery or triage. I, I triage quite a lot of patients and the direction of the best person to manage that patient, whether that's medically by procedure or surgically. And then the afternoon is uh, filled with meetings and uh, the evenings are often virtual meetings or recruitment dinners and that sort of thing. So it's pretty busy, but it's a wonderful privilege to both be able to help patients save lives, make the quality of life better and improve their long-term survival and still be able to work with the great physicians and nurses who take care of patients. Sure. Sure. And I guess for those who may not be familiar with the Cleveland clinic system, your, your Institute encompasses car department of cardiology, department of thoracic surgery, and then uh, cardiovascular and, and vascular surgery. Is that right? Yeah, so that's exactly right. So we have three departments, uh, cardiology, uh, cardiothoracic surgery, and vascular surgery. And then uh, we have extensive support uh, administration for that. 
and we have about 3,000 nurses in HVTI. So we run a hospital, uh, a heart hospital of some 500 beds, uh, about, uh, I think we're about 120 ICU beds uh, approximately. And um, we see, uh, and if you count it by visits, about three quarter of a million patients a, a year, uh, we typically run about 17, 18,000 in house uh, patients, hospitalized patients during the year. And um, if you take uh, Northeast Ohio, we do, uh, last year, I think we did 4,309 heart operations. That's apart from our operations in Florida, Abu Dhabi, and London. In total, it's about 6,300 heart, heart operations we oversee. Obviously, a huge number of cardiology patients and vascular surgery patients. That's an amazing amount of volume. And yet, all this time, you, you still remain the, the number one heart center in the world. I, I'm curious, maybe just your brief th thoughts on that, how you, know, how you guys continue to do that. I mean, it's just amazing. <laughs> well, I, I think a key part of that is that the Cleveland Clinic has a great model for taking care of patients. In other words, everybody's on a salary. So you don't have pool in either direction of uh, overdoing the number of procedures or doing too few procedures. I think it's a very nice balance. And it also encourages people to work in teams for the best care for our patients. Um, so that's a, a very nice aspect. And then we've always concentrated on quality and great outcomes for our patients, which means our reputation among patients and friends is very strong. And on top of that, it allows us to do research on outcomes and uh, share with uh, other physicians what we find helpful in the care of our patients uh, and also show what our outcomes are like. And we will typically run for most heart operations a risk of death for a procedure one third of uh, most uh, institutions. That's amazing. I, I kind of want to go back to a little bit of your training. You know, you trained under, as you mentioned, some of the early pioneers of cardiothoracic surgery, you know, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Uh, DeBakey in Houston, you know, many of the great surgeons at Cleveland Clinic. I guess, what are some of those, the most lasting impressions those, those individuals made on you, like as a trainee and how that's, you've carried that through your career? I'm just curious. I would say it's difficult to find a common denominator in what made them such great leaders, but certainly there was a, a, a attitude of great energy, uh, prepared to tackle all problems and think of ways to solve those problems. Um, and one sees that in a number of those surgeons that I worked with and I had the privilege of uh, counting as my mentors at various parts of uh, or stages of my career. And uh, so they were all extraordinary people. Um, and uh, they certainly would see a problem and they'd try and innovate and fix how that was done to deliver better care for patients. Interesting. So it's essentially not accepting the status quo as is and yeah. finding ways around it. Interesting. Sure. Going on that, you you know, like we were talking, you've played a major role in developing many new uh, techniques and um, innovations in aortic surgery, your field, and then some of the other innovations you mentioned, uh, like TAVR uh, procedures. I guess maybe walk us through your your innovative process, like how when you come up with an idea, like what's your process of kind of vetting that and determining, you know, further developing that, and then how do you convince people to adopt that? You know, essentially challenge the status quo. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, we could talk a lot about just that, but I will go back to something I actually wrote about last week. You know, we have uh, what is often referred to as the MRAD or, uh, or process for writing abstracts and manuscripts in, in medicine. And um, so introduction methods, results, and discussion. But my argument is that we as humans developed this during our Neolithic times and whenever that exactly started, we don't know, but clearly communication was uh, very much part of that and language. And so, you know, in the Neolithic period, people would sit around the campfire and say, okay, where are we gonna get food tomorrow or the next day? 
after that and uh, some would make a comment well we see the nuts are growing on the trees the tubers are coming up and we've seen the antelope coming back to uh, eat the tubers and then the group would uh, think about all right uh, here's the situation here's opportunity and then uh, they would prepare themselves for the next day foraging and hunting and gathering and go out and they'd have varying degrees of success and coming back or as they got back for dinner that night, they would sit around and say, okay, this is the result. So what challenges did you have? You know, I need a better spear for digging out the tubers or I need a new medication for paralyzing the antelope with the dart and that sort of thing. And, and I think that basic process is part of our human existence that uh, we know what we've got, we talk about it, we then think about how to make things better, we look at the results and then we innovate and try and make things even better. And I, I think if you look at the whole of human um, existence during the Holocene, uh, in other words, this period of good climate for humans last 12,000 years or so, it's been that. I mean, we went from being hunter-gatherers to pastoralists and agriculturists. Then we discovered the importance of various methods to do things better, whether that was steam engines or the Industrial Revolution, efficiency, Morse code and wireless transmission, the telephone, uh, and now obviously the digital information age, uh, somehow we've just been able to improve and improve and improve and innovate and innovate and innovate. And the same thing has happened in cardiothoracic surgery. There's been continuing innovation in what uh, can be done and what is done. In your field at radiology, look at how MRI has come along and uh, CAT scans and uh, those amazing imaging techniques we use nowadays. When I was a trainee, uh, CAT scans were just becoming available. Uh, MRIs were called nuclear magnetic resonance, which scared patients of being put in a nuclear device. So that was changed to magnetic resonance. And, uh, you know, in the old days, you, the recommendation was that 10% of the appendicectomies you did, the appendix was normal. Otherwise you were gonna miss too many and that was about consider the rate. Nowadays, of course, you get a CAT scan and see if there's inflamed appendix or not. You don't have to open the abdomen necessarily to do an appendicectomy. Interesting. As a, a leader of the Heart and Vascular Institute, I guess where what's your kind of vision for the future or, or like the most exciting developments that you're that you're working on and kind of you know, innovating the future of healthcare at the, or of heart care at the Cleveland Clinic? Well, I think there are two things one needs to think about for the future, and especially for young people. Firstly, uh, I don't see a big increase in professional fees for physicians, and increasingly physicians are going to work for hospitals because of the 1997 Balanced Budget Act. Uh, physicians um, are basically going to be paid at a neutral level. In fact, reimbursement for RVUs is going to go down by a dollar and 50 or something like that next year. So it's going to drop down to about $33 per RVU next year. And then there's another 4% cut on that. But on the other hand, when it comes to CMS payment to hospital, that's indexed to inflation. So we can expect for hospitals to continue to do reasonably well. They're under a lot of financial stress at the moment because of the consequences of COVID and staffing and nursing. Uh, so that is the sort of financial scenario. The other aspect of this is, as a generalization, more and more patients are being treated as outpatients. And partly that's because more and more procedures can now be done as outpatients. So for example, hip and knee replacements now are considered outpatient procedures. I think it's just a matter of time before TAVR is considered a outpatient procedure. And a lot of the minimum invasive procedures we do nowadays, for example, with robots allow patients to recover so much quicker 
and get out of hospital quicker. Uh, for example, for thoracic surgery, we used to run a hospital stay of a median of about eight days. That's down to about 3.4 days now with robotic lung resections. Um, same with robotic mitral valve repairs. Uh, so the trend is much more towards outpatient procedures, patients being treated as outpatients and less in hospital, though certainly here at the clinic, we see increasingly sicker, complex patients for multiple reoperations, that sort of scenario. So I think the big, if you want to call them quaternary hospitals, will continue to have a big workload of uh, very sick patients. Gotcha. I'm curious as a as a budding interventionalist, do you how as a surgeon, how do you see kind of that interplay between interventional procedures and and open surgery going forward? Do you, especially in particular in your field of cardiothoracic surgery, do you see more of these hybrid procedures or I think the biggest problem for interventional radiology is that you don't have clinical privileges at both hospitals. So you're dependent on other physicians. And that's always been the challenge for interventional radiology. And as you may very well know, originally interventional radiologists were doing a lot of uh, vascular procedures and that's much less so. And that included, for example, abdominal aortic aneurysms. But vascular surgery learned the skills, the wire skills to do that. Cardiology has acquired more and more uh, wire skills. And so, uh, you know, for example, with TAVO and some uh, cardiologists will even do abdominal or thoracic aneurysms. Um, and then if you look at, for example, electrophysiology and ablations and so on, that would used to be the realm of cardiac surgeons. But the electrophysiologists, their wire skills and what they can do is improve so much more. So they do that as ablations, uh, essentially outpatient procedures for most of them, just like pacemakers. Um, so the trend is much more towards transcatheter and percutaneous procedures. And, and I foresee that's going to continue. The big question is how much can the American healthcare system afford? Because a lot of these devices are very expensive. I mean, Tavo is a very expensive valve, uh, 32,500 for that valve, whereas a open heart procedure, it's a tenth of that often, the cost of that. So there's balance, obviously, length of stay and patient recovery. And so there are a lot of things that come into, but essentially patients want less invasive procedures, especially if the outcomes are equivalent. Sure. I guess as we, as we finish out here, what, what's your advice kind of reflecting back on your career for, and I realize we could probably do a whole hour podcast on this, but maybe your, your top tip uh, insights on, you know, budding residents and students that want to, you know, make innovative impacts on healthcare that want to kind of push the status quo as we talked about. <laughs> so I, I would say there are two aspects to that. Become a great clinician, be known as a very reliable physician and deliver uh, all the time the best you can for your patients. So there's a clinical aspect, the research and innovation, keep your interests broad, read broadly and have an inquisitive mind and always think about okay, I saw something for argument's sake um, on a car that uh, that looked really interesting. And that's a neat thing they're doing in cars. How can that be applied to what I'm doing in my job? Um, and uh, let's take, for example, just for argument's sake, the air filter in a car, there's a lot of similarities to the skirt on a Tavo valve. And I came up with some ideas how to reduce perivalve leaks uh, for TAVAR valves. And um, that's the solution that was used. Uh, another one is that when it comes to mechanical valves, the person who came up with that, he'd watched the locks on dams and how those lock doors lock together to stop blood, uh, sorry, not blood, uh, water leaking back through the lock. Well, he thought, well, what about doing that for heart valves? And so that's how the bide leaflet mechanical valves arose um, by stopping blood leaking backwards. That's a really good point. Essentially, 
kind of keeping your eyes open to unique solutions and maybe un, unassuming places. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess, lastly, I want to ask you about, cause we ask everybody this, what, what, when you're not doing all the busy things in medicine that you're doing, you, I know you have some very interesting outside interests. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I have fun hobbies. I, I think it's important that you have a number of things to make you resilient in, in your life. Um, and I give a talk on resilience, but I think having great hobbies, great friends, great family are all part of that. Uh, I love uh, photography and uh, spending time uh, and just being focused on my photography. And what I love about photography, you're freezing time for history. And you see that repeatedly. Now, videos, obviously, that's motion and time. Uh, but with photography, it's a moment that you capture in time. And my favorite is photographing birds in flight and seeing their wings and so on. And that's something that video just cannot capture, even in slow motion. And then from a history point of view and documenting um, how people and culture changes photography, uh, I think is better at that than video or films. Interesting. Interesting. Are you still an avid sailor? No, I, I, um, not sailing as much as I used to, I, I sold my 60 foot racing trimaran, but, uh, that in 2005, we set the record for Marion, Massachusetts to Bermuda. And as far as I know, that record hasn't been beaten yet. So we're rather proud of that. That's amazing. Wow. That's pretty cool. And I, I remember from your, your office, you had all these beautiful pictures all, all um, you know, from your trips to South Africa and, and elsewhere. So that's, it's very cool uh, how you balance your life outside the hospital. Um, well, Dr. Svensson, thank you again for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to talk with us. Appreciate your insights and uh, uh, telling us about your, your work as a cardiothoracic surgeon. Well, thank you, Max. And I think imaging, there's a lot of fantastic research in that. Uh, we've got a superb MRI research team now that's leading uh, um, in the country on MRI research. And I think uh, what imaging can do nowadays is just extraordinary. So uh, good luck with your uh, future. And it's been a pleasure talking to you and seeing you doing so well. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Da Vinci Hour podcast presented by Da Vinci Academy. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your podcast platform of choice to catch the latest episodes. Please leave a comment or a review and share it with a friend. Lastly, you can find all of our podcasts, video courses, and books on our website, dviacademy.com. Thank you for listening.